Hey everyone, welcome to another video. This is the first ever installment of refactoring subscriber code. But what we're going to do is actually refactor this tic-tac-toe game, which was submitted by Yvonne. And this was a project that Yvonne and Meg worked on together. So thank you for your submission, um, really appreciate it. And I'm excited to see how this concept turns out. Basically, what we're gonna be refactoring is this tic-tac-toe game. And you can see that there are two players to this game and you play until someone wins and then some sort of modal pops up and you can play again. You can also see that the state um, across games is tracked down here. So you can see player two has one win. And if we play the game again, you can see that player one will have one win. So it tracks everything. And then finally, you can wipe the score with that button up there. So once again, thank you, uh, Yvonne, for submitting this. I will leave both of their social links um, in the video description so you can go ahead and check them out. Um, this is actually going to be the first of three videos. So this particular video, I'm gonna briefly walk through the original project and make some notes on what I thought was good, what I thought could be improved. Um, I'm not gonna spend too, too much time on that because um, most of you are not the authors of this project and you know I, I wanna keep it uh, interactive and fun. Um, I know it's somewhat hard to read through someone else's code and quickly get up to speed. So I'll try to keep that one um, quick. And then the next two videos is where I'm going to actually take this project and build it in some different um, uh, with some different patterns. So the first one is going to be a vanilla JavaScript refactor where we're just using JavaScript, HTML and CSS, just like the original was done. Um, and I'll show you the patterns that I like to use when dealing with those three technologies and nothing else. Then I will bring it to maybe a more real world type implementation. Although a little bit overkill for the size of this project, we'll be building this in React as well. To watch this video or this video series, um, it's mainly aimed at beginners, beginner to intermediate level uh, developers. You should already know HTML, CSS, and JavaScript at some level. It can be very basic, but you need to understand how all of those things work together to build a web page. And you can also check out my 21 or 22, however many hours I've uh, published on my channel. Um, you can see a front end development course where I take you through learning each of these technologies. So HTML, CSS and JavaScript. So that should be a very good baseline for you. If you're not up to speed, um, you can jump around and pick the areas that you're not comfortable with and then come back to this video. All right. So without further ado, let's jump into the original project and walk through some of the good things and then some of the areas for improvement. Before I do that, I want to just show you what I have built. So this was the original that we looked at. This was um, the subscriber's submission. Now we can also go back um, to this page and let me let me quickly show you what I'm doing here. So if you can see at the bottom right corner, it says port 5500. This is a VS Code extension called Live Server that I have installed on my machine. So if you click live server, um, it's this one right here. There's a couple versions of it, I think, um, that you can use. They all kind of do the same thing. But this just allows us to serve local files on port 5500 or whatever port you specify. And in this repository, I have the original, the React refactor and the vanilla refactor. And live server is going to look for the index.html file in each of those directories and try to serve that in the browser. So to give you an example of the refactor that I did, we can click on the vanilla refactor and you can see what I've basically done. So um, first off, I have um, a reset or a menu over here that has different actions. So you can see that we've got some leftover, a leftover game that we could reset. And then you've got a little animation here to uh, designate who's up. You can also reset the scoreboard down here. So let's go ahead and uh, get someone to win the game. And you can see that's tallied down here. We can reset by saying new round and that wipes the scoreboard. 
Um, again, left some links down here for you to check out the original creators of this project. So that's just kind of what we're going to uh, move towards. Um, as you can see, almost everything is the same, just a few tweaks here and there. Most of the refactor is the design um, and the patterns that we're using to get this to work so that it's a little bit easier to extend into the future. All right, so if you are someone who did not create this project, which will be most of you, I recommend that you go to the GitHub repository that I've posted um, in the video description and just take a read through the original code. Now, I say this not so that you can go roast the original creators of this because they were good enough and gracious enough to submit their code for me to refactor. And we all are learning and nobody is gonna write perfect code, including the refactors that I've done. I've done my best, but it's not perfect. Someone could come through and say, oh, you did it completely wrong. So the reason that you wanna read through this is just to get familiar with what's going on in the application and trying to follow through um, and understand that. So uh, go ahead and pause the video, just skim through it to understand kind of what the game is doing. And then we're gonna jump into these notes here of what was good and what could improve with this project. So let's go ahead and start with the good parts. So with the HTML, I thought that overall there was a uh, clean structure so if you look at the index.html, just scrolling through this document, it's pretty easy to follow and there's not too much clutter going on. So I liked that. Um, the classes were pretty well named, um, the CSS classes, of course, and I thought it was just structured pretty well. So that's one of the good things. Um, the scripts and CSS um, link tags, were imported correctly. So those were, for the most part, in the correct spots. And then if we can come down to the what could improve for the HTML, um, we'll say boilerplate. I'll show you what this means in a second. Um, and then location of script tag. I'll show you that one as well. And then what was the last thing that I was going to talk about? Um, I think that was pretty much it. So when I say boilerplate, if we look at this index.html, there's no HTML tag surrounding it. So if I were to create, not a new folder, but a new file called improvement.html, we can actually use Emmet snippets in VS Code to type HTML and get some automatic boilerplate for a new project. So as you'll see, there's this HTML tag that surrounds the, the head and the body, which are direct children of it. And then we also have this doc type HTML at the top. Now the original did not have these and it still worked because technically those tags are optional and the browser will still know how to uh, parse this HTML and display it. But just as a best practice, that's what you wanna do. Now the next um, thing is the script is actually supposed to be at the very end of the body. And the reason it goes at the end of the body, not at the beginning or anything higher in the document is because you want everything else to run before your JavaScript because it's a lot faster to parse HTML um, than to run a bunch of JavaScript and your JavaScript could have blocking behavior that you know prevents interactivity um, in the, the HTML. So it's always best to put that at the end within the body. Now, how do I know all of this? Well, number one, just some experience of doing this quite a lot. And then also you could find all of these things out with the MDN docs. So this is where I go for pretty much all vanilla HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And what we could do is let's say that we wanted to know more about that HTML tag. So we'll go ahead and uh, type HTML and go to the elements reference. Um, and you can go ahead and click on the HTML tag. And what it will show you is how it's supposed to be used. So right here, you can read about what happens if the tag is omitted, like the original project had it. So if it's omitted, it will still work as long as there is no comment right before it or right after it, as it says right here. So just to make your project a little bit more stable, you probably don't want to omit that. 
And then it also says the permitted content or content is going to be one head element followed by one body element. So the permitted content only allows two uh, tags and the project, or let's look at the boilerplate, that's exactly what it does. So head and then body right there. Um, and then also you could look for something like doc type. So let's say doc type and that just shows you the doc type shebang at the top. And it basically says its sole purpose is to prevent a browser from switching into quirks mode. Um, basically saying it just makes sure everything is stable and you're not gonna get different behavior depending on which browser you're using. So I could walk through all of these different things here and explain why they're there, but I just wanted to show you how you could go about finding that and um, understanding the correct usage of HTML. All right, so let's get back to the notes. Um, let's see, let's move on to the CSS. So I thought the um, CSS had good use of selectors, um, or let's say descendant selectors. I thought overall good class naming. Uh, and then what else could we say? Um, CSS reset, font imports. I thought all of those things were good. So let's go ahead and open that up to style CSS. So here's the global reset that they did. This is a good idea to have for any project in your global styles file. In this case, it's just one big CSS file for the entire project. In bigger projects, you might see this split uh, across files, depending on you know whether you're using vanilla CSS or maybe an external CSS library or framework or something like that. But nevertheless, this is always great to have. It's just a basic reset. And you could just type this in and say CSS reset. And you'll get all sorts of um, resources on here. Um, CSS tools, reset CSS. Uh, this is way more than you need, um, but you can just search and um, there's a lot of different versions of this. This is a good basic one. And then also I noted that you're using the import at rule. Um, so there's a bunch of different at rules that you can use for CSS. You can type that into MDN and go through these and you can see that um, there should be some sort of import here, right there. So if you click import, this is a CSS at rule is used to import uh, style rules from other valid style sheets. So what they're doing here is using that at rule to import uh, Google fonts. Um, so thought that was a good pattern. And then as you go through, I had mentioned the selectors are pretty clean. I liked uh, seeing things like this where you're targeting all of the unordered lists within an element that has the middle class on it. And then furthermore, you know, you've got all of these uh, going on. There was one down here that I liked. Let's see. Uh, right here, this is an efficient way to select all um, elements within a certain element. So overall, I thought that that was a good pattern. Um, now in terms of things that could be improved, um, really with CSS in a smaller project like this, it's going to be inherently a little bit messy. There's not a whole lot that you can do to, to make it look really, really clean. Um, so I'm not gonna get too picky about that kind of stuff. Um, the only thing that I would say with the CSS is uh, maybe some reusability. Um, I saw a little bit of duplication there that we'll, we'll go through in the refactor. And then also just general styling. Um, if you look at the difference between um, this is my project here and then the original project right here, I just saw a couple styles that I thought were a little bit off. So you've got the shadow um, and the border here and they're a little bit different sizes. Um, I just cleaned that up a bit. I do not claim to be any designer by any means, so I didn't really spend a whole lot of time on this, but just a few things to clean up the styles. Um, all right, and then finally, with the JavaScript, this is what we're gonna spend the most time on in the refactor. Um, I'm just gonna make a few notes here, and then I'll save the rest for the actual refactor where I'm walking through the rationale behind it. So the good things. 
um, that I saw. State was consolidated. Um, elements were pre-selected. Good use of session storage. All right, so let's walk through each of those. So state was consolidated. What I mean by that is if you go to the JavaScript file, you can see all of these state variables that are going to be mutated as the game progresses. They're all in one spot. So that's nice to see uh, right there. And then going back, uh, elements were pre-selected. I liked how all of the elements that would be interacted uh, or that would have JavaScript interactivity were consolidated um, into one spot. And you'll see in my refactor, I've done a similar thing. And then also good use of session storage. Um, coming down here, you can see that we're keeping track of the score. Um, so that's down here, the score that persists across browser refreshes. Um, oops. So if we were to play this game out and get some state down here, if we refresh the page, it's not going to change because we're storing that in browser storage rather than in memory. Now with my refactor, I chose local storage, which is a little bit different. So if we go to session storage right here, it describes what that is. And it says it's very similar to local storage. The two main differences is uh, session storage is going to be completely destroyed when you close the tab that it's in or the entire browser. Well, local storage um, is going to still be loaded if you close the tab and reopen it. Now, another thing is local storage can be accessed across tabs. So let's say I'm in this tab and I wanted to access the local storage um, over here. I could do that. It all reads the same from the same place. And the reason I chose that is so that with the refactor game, you can have player one in one tab and player two in another tab. And it can be a little bit more realistic that way. But overall, I thought that was a good pattern. It's, it's a great thing to use something a bit more persistent than in-memory variables, um, just so that you can store things over time. Um, and then last thing, I didn't mention it, um, but I really liked this strategy for detecting a winning pattern. So as you can see in the game here, we have to know every time we click one of these squares, we have to be able to calculate whether player one has won or player two has won or if the game is still in progress. And I really liked that pattern that was used here. Um, this is very simple and elegant. Um, and you'll see that I've used this in my refactor. Now, in terms of the things that could be improved a little bit about the JavaScript, um, we'll say the overall design pattern. Um, as you'll see in my vanilla refactor, we'll be using um, kind of a pseudo MVC pattern or model view controller pattern to just organize things a little bit better. Um, and this will help us uh, so that in the future, if we wanted to add features to this game, it will be a lot easier to do. If you look at the main.js file, um, especially for someone that has not seen this code before, which is going to be most of you, um, it's, it's a little bit tough to just jump in and understand exactly what's going on. And part of that is just any project is going to take some time to get used to. But this big um, function here, I think we can consolidate this a little bit and separate things out a little bit. So overall design pattern, I'm going to talk about global uh, variables. So what I mean by that is if we look at all of these variables right here, and then pretty much everything throughout the app, everything defined here is in the global scope. So what that means is that if you start growing this project and you start defining multiple files and you know you kind of forget what you defined in this file, you might start running into variable naming collisions. Um, and it's also just best practice to keep state um, uh, in as small of a scope as you possibly can. So basically what this means is if we define some variables, um, we probably want this in some sort of namespace. So let's say that we called it app and then we created an object. And then instead of having tie score or something in the global scope, we put it in um, the namespace of app. So the reason that this is important is because with all of this global, um, all of these global variables, 
you can see that I can access these. So let me copy tie score and go to the browser and inspect. And what you'll see is in the console, we can actually print the value of tie score because it's in that global scope. So you can print any of these. So click counter, um, you can type that out. Let's go ahead and do that. So click counter, that's available to us. And what we want to do is create it so that everything is namespaced. So you'll see it in the refactor, but what we really want is just one um, variable that kind of encompasses and puts a closure over um, all of the different variables that we're defining. So that way we'll access it through that namespace and we're not going to run into any sort of variable collisions in the future. One thing that I forgot to mention on the CSS side of things is if we go to this game, so this original game, and we start collapsing it to a mobile device, you'll see that everything gets cut off. Now, it's not a huge deal. In some apps, you don't need to be mobily responsive, um, but generally it's good practice to make sure that your app works on a mobile device and a desktop. Um, so what you'll see in my refactor and by no means did I put a ton of time and effort into this, but with my vanilla refactor, you'll see that at uh, a certain breakpoint, it's gonna change to a smaller version of it. And then as we go to a mobile device, it's going to kind of resize so that you can play on a mobile device. So that was just one improvement that you can make, um, something that you might think about when starting a project. All right. So that's pretty much it. Um, the next video I will leave in the video description um, and also in the end notes or something like that. Go ahead and watch that. It's going to be the full refactor where we go through all of these improvements that could be made. And we basically start this project from scratch, um, trying to recreate the original, um, but with some different patterns, um, make it a little bit more extensible, so on and so forth. I've chosen to basically write it from scratch, not because I think that you know this project, this original project is not salvageable. I think you could definitely refactor it without recreating it. I just went down that path and found that making a YouTube video trying to explain things was very, very difficult and would be very confusing to people who had not built this app. So we will be starting it from scratch and you'll be able to kind of pick up on some patterns